Thank you, thank you, um, Stefan um, Herbert, for inviting me to this um, meeting. So I'll be talking about re sort of recent progress towards Onsaga's conjecture, and this is joint work with uh, Camilla Delilis and my supervisor Laszlo Sekihidi. And so I guess we've seen this equation before, since this this is a mini workshop on Euler. So this is the um, Euler equation in Euler equation, and so it's quite easy to see that for a smooth solution, we have the kinetic energy is conserved. Simple calculation, multiply the equation by the first equation by V, and we get um, an integrate, and integrate the parts, and we get this formal conservation of kinetic energy. Now, in turbulence theory, a so a, a distinctive feature of turbulent flow is that the um, is that you expect these solutions to dissipate energy, and um, at least for when we look at weak solutions for Euler, so we're not looking at smooth solutions, but rather we 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 test these functions against a test function. It's known for quite some time that these solutions don't necessarily con um, conserve energy. And so I guess the first result in that direction was by Schaeffer, um, led later by Schneerman, and they both presented flows which have compact support in time, which Adris TT described as nightmare solutions. His analogy is that you have, you when you go to bed, you put some water in your glass and you put it next to your bedside table, and it's still, and then you fall asleep, you wake up in the middle of the night, and it starts oscillating wildly, and then you go back to bed, and you wake up, and it's still. And so it's like a nightmare that this sort of thing can't physically happen. And so he termed this nightmare solution. Of course, these solutions are not physical. You don't expect water, which is completely at rest, to just start oscillating violently and then go to rest again. But anyway, you do expect turbulent flows to dissipate energy. So that's something you, you do expect. So the conjecture we're interested in was first proposed by um, Lars and Saga. Um, and specifically, he conjectured criteria for it's not, it wasn't, his original paper wasn't written in this weak solution formalization, but he actually looked at the Fourier coefficients, and he wrote um, sort of decay properties in the Fourier coefficients. But in the end, it, it, it ends up being something like this. So any he conjectured that any solutions which belong to a Holder space for a Holder exponent greater than a third conserve energy, and more, and that there exist weak solutions for any Holder exponent less than a third which do not conserve energy. Now, the first part of this conjecture is fully resolved. So um, it was so first considered by Eink, and then later proved by Constantine A and Titi. Um, and they actually proved a stronger result. Namely, they proved that solutions belonging to this specific Bessel space, um, where I mean, it's key that the the regularity is, is greater than a third, so it's just has some has the same regularity as on Saga's conjecture. That solution, weak solutions belonging to this um, space conserve energy, and so I might just give this proof because it shows. I mean, one question is where does this one third come from? So the proof is very simple. So the original paper was about three pages, I think. 
So what you do, I mean, for simplicity, we'll assume that this solution to Euler has some differentiability in time. This is not critical, and I'll explain where this actually assumption comes in and how to remove this assumption. But so for now, so assume V, which is a solution, a weak solution to Euler, um, is differentiable. Can you read this? Yeah. So in time. Okay, so and now modify the solution. And so we, we define VL to be the standard modification. And then we can write we can write an identity for the for the energy of this modification. So this is just a modification at length scale L. This is a standard modifier. So, so we look at the look at the energy at time t. We subtract off the energy at the initial time. And so this is just an explicit calculation. We have this is 2 times the integral from 0 to t, and then the integral on the torus. So this is all on the torus, three dimensional torus. So the trace. Uh, yeah. For the entire talk, u equals v. So we take the tensor product and multiply it by L, and we have the gradient u L. So we want to estimate this term here, and we want to estimate this term here as L goes to zero. And this is precisely where we assume differentiability in time. And it's not actually required. We could actually modify in time as well, and then take this time modification to zero, and then prove this identity here as well, as long as we have continuity in time for L2. So since by integration by parts, we have so UL temp, so what the trace of UL temp UL gradient of u l is identically zero. Then we can just subtract it off this equation here. And so we get, so this is equal to star. We get star is just two times integral from zero to t, integral in space. And now we have a commutator. So we have u and the u l minus u l and the u l and then the gradient of u l uh, dx dx. So the scaling to keep in mind is that we have three u's and one derivative. And we'll see how we get one third from that. So uh, uh, you have a standard estimate on this on this commutator here. So this commut let's call this one and this 
gradient is true. So a standard estimate is that, so this, this norm here will be the uniform norm. So this uniform norm can be estimated by L, um, the power of 2R, where R is the regularity of the solution, and then U from the Holder norm, R squared. So this is just a very standard, simple commutator estimate. And then the remaining estimate is just the, the simple modification estimate. So, so 2 is L um, minus 1 uh, plus R U R. So we get the whole thing. So star is less than or equal to, or that I guess you know, there's constants that, but this is not important. So L 3 R minus 1. U R three. So here we see the one third. So this 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 will obviously go down to this will so this right hand side will converge to zero as long as R is greater than one third. So we have three U's and one derivative. So this is where so it's just a simple scaling argument. And uh, so this is where we get this one third. And just because we have this simple scaling argument does not necessarily imply that the converse is true. So, so part A is, so I did everything in Holder norm, but of course you can do the same argument in the Bessel norm, and it's the same argument. Exactly, and then this is where this is getting rid of the waste. You get this estimate here, where it becomes L3 in time, and this is important for later on. So of course there's waste, and this this is why this uniform. Sorry, um, but you can apply exactly the same estimate with these norms here, and you'll get naturally this L3 popping up because you'll have the integrating in time. So this is the this is the regularity parameter and this is the integrability parameter. Yeah. yeah. Um, so what am I saying? But it's useful to keep this in mind because this will come up. Okay. So the first result in this direction, in terms of uh, from the other side, which is non solutions which do not conserve energy and belong to a holder space was due to Delelis and Sakahidi, and it was part of two papers. Um, and in the second paper, they proved that there exist solutions with holder regularity one-tenth minus epsilon. And this was improved by Phil um, Isaac, where he considered the transport properties of the Euler equation, and he improved the, um, the analysis of the transport part of the equation, and he improved this exponent to, so one-fifth minus epsilon. And then shortly after, we gave a simpler proof, which is, I mean, the main, the main feature of our proof is that it's much shorter, I guess. The filler sets was about 200 pages, and ours is about 40 or so. But um, there's an additional property which there's, we can actually prescribe the energy profile. So if I, at the beginning I talked about nightmare solutions, the filler sets solutions are sort of nightmare solutions with compact support. And if you want to, so there's a school of thought that we should look at admissibility criteria in order to obtain uniqueness. And one possible criteria, which doesn't seem to obtain uniqueness, is that uh, is to 
ensure that the energy is monotonally decreasing in time. And so you can do this with our construction. But it doesn't, it's, it's truly non-unique. So, and now, going back, so if we look at this analysis of this proof, which is quite natural and it's just scaling, so it, it, it looks like a quite a natural proof. Um, one may ask if the original Nzaga conjecture is, in a sense, the wrong question to be asked. Whether we should instead replace the holder regularity with vessel space and replace these uniform norm norms by inter some integrability. And so this is this weak version of Nzaga. And this weak version indeed also corresponds very much with the uh, Kolmogorov four-fifths law, which is the one law which people sort of accept because it's the one law for turbulence that doesn't have, say, intermittency corrections and so forth. It seems to be very stable. And so instead of just looking at this Zaga conjecture, one may look at this Kolmogorov four-fifths law and see if this is true. And so this is more in the line of Kolmogorov four-fifths law. Of course, he, in his law, he looks at ensemble averages. And for when you're looking at realizations of the Euler equation, it's natural to re replace these with uh, time averages. And so this is why you have this L3 in time. So considering this weaker version, we, there's been sort of two results in this sort of direction. So the first result by myself was that we construct, or I constructed solutions that do not conserve weak solutions, which belong to this holder one-fifth minus epsilon norm. But for almost every time, they belong to the Onsaga critical norm. They belong to a holder regularity of one-third minus epsilon. And actually, you can show that the, the set of times that don't belong to this norm is in a um, temporal subset with Hausdorff dimensions strictly less than one. But it's just not particularly important. And so in, in, in doing this, what we did is what I did was to create a, a look at things on a temporal basis, and we, it involved creating a much more complicated structure in time. And in fact, the structure in time is a fractal-like structure. And pushing this further, this argument further, and seeing how far we can push it is what we did in this latest paper, um, where we managed to get L1 in time. So in particular, integrating the spatial norm, the, the spatial C one third minus epsilon norm in time, we, we get boundedness of this norm. And this, these solutions have incredibly complicated fractal structure in time. And in, in the argument is, is somewhat a sort of dynamical systems argument. Um, and one, if, if one would like to try to push this further, it will sort of become exponentially more complicated. And that's one problem with pushing these arguments further. But in a sense, these sort of arguments could be quite general and should, could be used for other, um, other arguments involving convex integration where you have this time. So we have a transport nature of so forth. And one thing I should point out is that all these arguments related to Ansaga conjectures, a somewhat different flavor than what Anton was talking about. Because in, so Anton, the convex integration with Anton is, is more on the, on the style of this Gromov or um, Stefan Muller, Schwerak sort of style. Whereas these um, methods more on the style of the original argument by Nash. So, so, 
but it has the, but it has the different integrability. So we have L3 here. Um, so the I, we have traded space and we have we have traded we've traded integrability for 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 uh, we traded reg, uh, integrability for regularity, um, but we don't know how to. We we c cannot simply say trade spatial um, integrability for um, time regularity. We can't do that. Well, at the moment, we can't do that. If we could do that, that's, in, I mean, it's a, I think we, what we could do is, for example, I sort of lied there. We can, I, I think we can do that, but it would be a direct swap. <laughs> so we could, for example, I think you can, sw you can swap this L1 in time to be um, uh, continuous in time but have this to be a Bessel space where the integrability is one. So it would be B um, theta uh, infinity one. And, and, and this would be a different solution, so you can't interpolate or anything like that. <laughs> um, so, the basic idea of this, of this iteration scheme is that we solve this so-called Euler-Reynolds system, and this system of equations arises naturally when you take a regular solution to Euler and you average on some spatial scale. And then you get a Reynolds stress here. And so our solutions will be constructed from a sequence of perturbations which will all have a certain frequency scale. And so you could think of these um, approximations as simply being the average of the final solution at a given length scale. That's just a sort of fixed thing. It's not how we do it, but, that, but it should line up in the end. So we'll call our perturbation W. And, I, and so our frequency will be called lambda q. And so one of the so one of the one of the original starting points of, of my of my thesis was to look at precisely how all these scales work. And so in in terms of theory, you have natural scales that you consider. So in turbulence theory, so you think of a turbulent solution being a hierarchy of eddies, where you have large eddies which break up and form small eddies and break up and form small eddies. Um, and each eddy has a characteristic um, length scale. And given this characteristic length scale, um, you have a characteristic vo velocity. And given that velocity, you also have this turnover time, which is the length scale divided by the velocity. Now, this turnover time is, is, is just a simple argument for any, it comes from simple transport estimate, where it's, it's, it's the expected time that you expect uh, the transport equations to deviate from the linear back, so that just being linearly transported. And so this is the time scale that you expect eddies to break up, or the time scale that you expect the, the energy to be transported to another level. And this turnover time will be very important in the, it will be basically the time scale that we should, the resolution, the time resolution scale that we should uh, look at our solution in time. So. Given that we have this, we, we suppose that we have some scheme which has, is built on a sequence of perturbations at the, um, with um, certain eddy length, well, certain frequency length, where the frequencies go to infinity, then um, we have natural estimates that we expect to happen on the perturbation and on the Reynolds stress. So this is not, 
I haven't told you what these perturbations are, but this is just the natural estimates that you would require in order to obtain hold irregularity for, say, for a regularity exponent beta greater than, greater than zero or, or, and less than a third. So you expect the perturbation to be that each derivative will pick up a lambda q, which is the frequency, and but we have this minus beta from the regularity. I mean, this is just simple heuristic. So one thing to note is that the Reynolds stress can be broken up into three different parts. Um, so we have this so-called oscillation error, the transport error, and what's called the Nash error. And the oscillation error is also sort of very Nashy that we solve this. Um, we correct the Nash, the oscillation error, by a simple algebraic argument. And so, what's different than the Nash scheme is how we handle the transport error, and that will be a big problem. And the Nash error is just an error which is very easy to estimate. Estimate. Um, and I'll do that now, even though I haven't said what the perturbation is. But just going from the basic heuristics, and the Nash error is why it's called the Nash error is it's a typical type of error that we see in the Nash argument. So this is just a heuristic estimate. Given that we have this scaling as I described before, so we take, remember the, the Reynolds stress is in, has a, a divergence in the front of it. Um, so we need to take the so, a so-called inverse of the divergence, which means solving the divergence equation. So informally, we'll just call it the inverse of the divergence. Um, So you need to define what this operator is, of course. Now you take, we're considering this last term here. So WQ, the dot product of VQ minus 1. And we're looking at the uniform norm. And so what the inverse divergence expects to do is that you get a gain if, if, if a given quantity is at a certain frequency, you get a gain corresponding to that frequency. So in this case, this Nash error will be at frequency lambda q because wq is at lambda q and vq minus 1 is lambda, lambda q minus 1. So the whole quantity should be roughly at, at uh, lambda q. And so we're going to assume actually that the frequencies grow at a super exponential rate. This is not particularly important, but it's in they'll only just grow at a super exponential rate. But you can actually get rid of this. Um, part of this was a bit of us being lazy. But so this is B um, for so B is greater than one. Okay. So Estimating this, we ex first of all expect a gain of lambda q. We're taking the inverse of the divergence. And then we have the uniform norm of wq. And we have the c1 norm of vq minus 1. Now, going back to our simple. Um, 
simple heuristic estimates. I mean, uh, I mean, VQ is Q minus one is borne by all the perturbations. As long as these frequencies grow at a quick enough rate, what we get is this is less than or equal to. So, um, so lambda Q minus one. So this this quantity is lambda Q minus one one minus beta, which is the regularity, and then times lambda Q. Uh, minus B minus 1. Now, we assume so let's call this quantity star. We assume that star is less than or equal to lambda Q plus 1 minus 2 beta. So where do we, why do we assume this? Because this is pre precisely what our inductive estimates are in the Reynolds stress. And then now this just becomes a simple quantity. Now you can just work this out. So we, we can substitute this B in here. And what we do is we, and substituting this in, uh, we end up with the restriction that beta, which is our regularity, is less than or equal to 1 on 2b plus 1. So take b to 1, and you get, again, 1 on 3. So this Nash error doesn't seem to be, doesn't seem to impose any restrictions on Antarg. The problem is the other two do. So these sort of heuristic estimates happen all the time in our, our So the next error to deal with is this oscillation error, which is the, the top one, this quadratic estimate or quadratic term. So we need that the some sort of cancellation with that perturbation with the previous Reynolds stress. How we do this is that we will need so-called Beltrami flows which just so which are just solutions to the equation. So we, it's a stationary divergence-free vector field satisfying this Beltrami condition, where here this lambda is called the Beltrami coefficient. Of course, when lambda is a constant, it just becomes an eigen, uh, eigenfunction of the, of the curl. And then if we have this property, then we have this uh, easy identity. So this is just the vector identity here. And then um, using the divergence free property. Um, and then um, this part is orthogonal. So this disappears. And then we end up with this last term here. And so we, we just set this last term to be the pressure. And we get a stationary solution to the Euler equation. Now, these Beltrami flows are quite natural to think of in turbulence theory because uh, it's been sort of conjectured that turbulence can be viewed as a sort of a, as a, lot, a super, turbulence can be viewed uh, is locally very much like, or is very much like, ha has the structure of these Beltrami waves, so sort of approximate Beltrami waves, and you, they, so I think Constantine and Foyash had this paper with regards to um, decomposing turbulence into sort of a hierarchy of, of, of approximate Beltrami waves. So this is sort of somewhat motivated by motivate, mo motivated by the sort of applied literature. And so this brings us to our ANSATs, that our perturbation will be just the superposition of Beltrami flows oscillating, oscillating at a given frequency, so it's lambda q plus 1. Um, so, uh, so here it's just, here we see that oscillating at frequency, and this is just the wave vector, and this is some coefficient 
function that we have to define. And we have to define this coefficient function in such a way that we have this cancellation here. So um, when we pair, when we pay, pair, um, when we pair Beltrami flows with uh, wave vectors that are the additive inverse, we expect the cancellation of the low frequency uh, of the previous Reynolds stress. Uh, of course, there'll be cross terms, and we need to estimate these cross terms. And there'll be what we'll do, we'll have an extra degree of freedom by adding on this rho, which will be a function of time only. So when we take the divergence of this term, of course, it'll be zero. So the question is whether we can do this, whether we can construct these Beltrami waves in such a way. Um, and so, um, and we can. Um, and what we do when we solve this, it's just an algebraic problem. And when we solve this algebraic problem, we get um, precisely what we want um, here. So we get this cancellation of the Reynolds stress. We get a term which can be absorbed into the pressure. And then we get some high, highly oscillatory error. So here we have this lambda q k plus k prime. So this is good. The reason why this is a good term is that we see that the derivative is falling on the coefficient function. The derivative is not falling on the high frequency guy. If the, if the derivative was falling here, then we would we'd lose because the derivative is falling on here. And these, these coefficients are roughly of frequency lambda q because they're defined in terms of the previous Reynolds stress error. Then we'll only get a lambda q. But when, of course, when we're estimating the new Reynolds stress error that this, that this, this, this whole thing produces, we're going to get a gain of lambda q plus 1. So we're going to get this um, estimate of lambda q divided by lambda q plus 1, which is similar to this case here. Where we're, so this is all, so this is q minus 1 divided by lambda q. So this is add, add 1 to the q. We have this one here and minus one here, so it's a similar case here. So this is good. And in fact, the estimate that we get from this guy is also poses no obstruction to Ansage. And I'll skip this for now. And so this is just the construction. So there's an explicit construction of the Beltrami flow, and there's a <coughs> explicit way of constructing these coefficient functions, which is just algebraic in nature. Okay? So, so far I haven't said why we can't get inside this conjecture, and the reason is we also have to deal with the, the transport error, which is this term here. And so, the ansatz that we had before is not quite correct, or it's not, it's not a very good one, and the reason, the, the problem with it is precisely that it's not very well transported by the previous flow. So we need to modify our ansatz. So this is our ansatz um, here. We need to modify this ansatz such that, uh, such that it's better transported by the previous a pro, a flow, this VQ. And so the main error, of course, arises when this transport derivative, which this or effective derivative or material derivative, falls on, on the highly oscillatory term. And so how we fix this is we cut off in time. Um, we have cutoff functions which whose, whose square is a partition of unity of time. And so, so the picture to have in mind is that we, so we have time and we cut off into certain, we, we cut off in time and we have points in the middle, which are called these, uh, so we have this stupid, this silly 
bar stigma, which is always yeah, difficult to think. Anyway, so the, the, these times are, are, we label as T bar stigma, and what we do is that we we replace this highly oscillatory term with a solution to the transport equation. And so this solves the transport equation directly with initial data such that um, the, the phase function is uh, just x. So it's exactly the same as our original um, oscillatory term at, at the midpoint of the, of the support of the cutoff function. And then we evolve this phase function um, with the previous flow. And in order to keep track of all the derivatives, we also need to actually um, modify this previous approximate um, solution to the Euler equation by some length scale. But this is not so important. This is these sort of issues in terms of these modifications are similar to in Nash, where you have to deal with this so-called loss of derivative problem. And so this is the main error. And so as if we assume that the, the support of these cutoff functions is very small, of course, then uh, terms will still behave like this oscillatory term here, and we'll get good uh, oscillation estimates. But there's a trade-off, because the trade-off is that when the time derivative falls on the cutoff function, of course, we'll get a large error. And so there has to be some sort of optimi optimization between this error that we get from the cutoff function and the error that we get from uh, the oscillatory, uh, from, from the um, perturbation from, the, from our Beltrami flow. So if we, if we solve this transport equation for too long, then we no longer have flows that behave like Beltrami flows. And we won't have these nice properties that we saw before. Now there's a secondary error, which is when the material derivative falls on the coefficient functions, because the coefficient functions are also defined in terms of the previous Reynolds stress. And so then you need transport errors of the previous Reynolds stress, and you need to keep track of this. And so you need an argument which is that actually very similar to this uh, in order to deal with that. To deal with that case. But I won't, I won't go into that. That's a secondary error. And so, some, so this was handled um, differently by Phil this day, but it, the principal ideas here were first shown by him. The, first, the, 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 problems, the problems that he encountered were exactly the same, and he solved them in a, a slightly different way. And so what I'll now show. I still have 15 minutes. Okay. So if we just draw the cut, uh, uh, typical cutoff function, okay, then there will be certain parameters associated with the cutoff function. So this is this chi here, chi here. Um, so first of all, the area, the the, the the time interval on which the cutoff function is identically one is of a certain length which we call the inverse of mu. Um, and there's also the length of the support of the derivative of the, of the cutoff function, which is also the regions where the cutoff functions overlap. It's also the overlapping region. And this overlapping region will be parameterized by an additional parameter, which we call eta. So it will be eta mu. Eta mu minus one. 
<laughs> um, so we have these two quantities, and, and this will be important. So given these two uh, quantities, first let's consider estimates on the regions where on this non-overlapping zone, where we have no contribution by the time derivative of the cutoff function. So on this region, so on the, on the non-overlapping regions, so once you do all the estimates, what you do, what you get is that the the new Reynolds stress error will be so lambda q uh, one minus beta. So don't don't pay too much attention to the exact form. Minus two beta and uh, so minus one divide by mu. So what is important is that this part here is roughly just this part here is roughly the previous velocity, the C1 norm of the previous velocity divided by the support of the cutoff function. So these are the sort of, and these sort of, um, you get these sort of terms in any estimates of transfer of, of, of when you're, this is, the, this is the fact that this oscillatory term will approximate the original um, term, which was for the Beltrami flows, as long as that the, as long as that the support is sufficiently small. So this is, so what we get here is we have a, we have a, this, this term will be very small as long as the, as the support is very small of the cutoff function. So we get, we have this term where mu is in the bottom, and naturally we also expect a term where mu will be on the top. So this is on the non-overlapping region, and then this is, sorry, the, the, this is the uniform norm. Okay? So the important thing is that we have this mu on the bottom. Okay? And so on the overlapping region, so let's call this star. Oh, let's call this one. Um, we have that R Q plus one zero is less than or equal to so now we expect a mu on the top. This this comes from uh, differentiating the cutoff function in time. It's actually, I mean, so it's just when this material derivative falls on the cutoff function. So what we get is mu lambda q plus 1 minus beta minus 1. Okay? Uh, and there's an inter divided by beta. So, so in, in the 1 on 5 minus epsilon case, we just set uh, eta to be some constant, small constant, say 1 on 10, so it plays no role. And then, so this is 2. And implicitly, we're assuming that, that uh, 2 is greater or equal to one. And this is natural because we will still get these estimates on the overlapping region as well. So this is just enforced in this case. And you can enforce this by choosing mu in a particular way. So we set eta such that to be one on 10, and we set mu such that so the two terms are equal. So one and two are equal. And then if you do the calculations, like I did with the Nash, 
Um, this all leads to the, the regularity is you, you can show the existence of non conservative solutions for regularity in the solution um, in C one fifth minus epsilon. Now for the one on three case, we we have to do something more complicated. So in In one of three minus epsilon case, we actually have that the that two is much larger than one. Okay, so what we expect is that we get worse estimates on this on this on this overlapping region, and we get better estimates on this on this non-overlapping region. And so this is why we introduced eta. So if you remember that in this one on three case, we're, inter we're interested in just integrating in time. So as long as this, so we're going to get worse estimates here, but as long as the, the support of the, of the overlapping region is significantly small, we get a gain in this L1 in time norm. So there's going to be this trade-off that uh, we'll get terrible uniform norms, but as long as we integrate in time, we get better estimates. And so you end up with this complicated dynamical system where the, so in, in, in this particular case, mu and eta uh, depend on the time interval. So before, in the one on fifth case, so in, in, in this one on fifth, one on five ca case, so in the time interval, we, we divided time into uniform time interval. This is for the one on five. And for the one on three case, it's going to be very complicated. It's going to be some fractal structure. It's good. I mean, it's good. There, there'll be structure in there, but it'll be a fractal structure. And so, and at each, and, and so it'll become more and more complicated and it'll become, a, it will be reduced to a dynamical argument. So what would, I still have five minutes or nine minutes? Five minutes? So if we take, if we consider the sets V, I, Q, where Q is the iteration, such that if the, we consider the, the times where the perturbation, W, Q, is approximately uh, lambda I to the power of minus 1 on 3 plus Epsilon. This is not exactly what we do in the paper, but this is just to give an idea. Then we we need to bound the size of, of, of these sets. So uh, and so when we're estimating estimating this L1 norm in, in in time and C one third minus epsilon in space we end up with a natural constraint on the size of these sets here. And since we have the, uh, this constraint on the size of the sets here, this gives a constraint on our eta. Gives a con because this eta describes how, sm how, how large the region is of the overlapping region that have a certain regularity. And so there'll be a very complicated dynamical system here. It's, it's very hard to explain, but the idea is things get really messy. And so I'll leave it like that.
So it is easier. So in the case with without integrability, we still divide up time uniformly. And we actually def we divide it up in, in, in time in the exact same picture as this 1 on 5 minus epsilon case. But we choose epsilon to be equal to lambda q minus so eta to be lambda q minus some small epsilon. So all you need is that epsilon is very small, um, but greater than zero. And what this ensures is, is that the, um, as, the, as q goes to infinity, that the overlapping region gets very tiny, and then uh, the regions, you know, it's very probable that the for a given time, for almost every time, there exists an iteration such that it no longer will ever be in the overlapping region. And then you do the right estimates on, on these times, and then you get, you get the one on three. So it's much simpler. In, in the L1 time, these mu and the eta depend on, on the given time interval, and it becomes a diabolical dynamical system, I hope. So all this stuff works for two. It hasn't been written down, but um, so um, Antoine uh, did the one on ten case for for two D, and you can adapt the arguments for two D with the, this sort of construction. In terms of there is there so in terms of a general argument. Um, so recently, Vlad Vikol and Phil Asset put a paper on, on the archive, which is even more general. They don't just consider the Euler equation. They consider a family of, um, of active scalar equations. And they showed that these sort of arguments hold for all these family of structures, but they get re worse regularity. And what they actually do is they can only sort of fix the error in one, in one direction for a, given, for a given iteration. And so the higher the dimension, the worse, um, the worse estimates they get. Um, but whether this specific, I mean, you'd have to create an uh, so analogy of these of these Beltrami flows, basically, for for higher dimensions in order to do that. And if you can do that, then there's no reason why it shouldn't hold. I I, I don't know what the, what the I, I guess maybe Antoine knows more about that. So in the original paper, they had a very um, complicated proof of, uh, of, of, of for this algebraic property, where they they had had to have many wave vectors to prove it. But in fact, you just need um, you just need uh, six. I, I wait. You need you well. You need twelve. <laughs> you need twelve wave vectors because there's six dimensions in, in, in symmetric matrices, basically. Um, and you, um, for symmetric matrices, so you need, you need 12 because you have to have the algebraic inverse. Um, and it's a, it's a very simple algebraic argument. You basically create, you, you find six very simple wave vectors, which just look like, um, so one, one, 0, 
um, there are one, uh, sorry, yeah, there are one, there are one, and sorry, false, there are one, one, and uh, what is it? So that's three. You take plus and minus this, I guess. And, and you have six, and then you can add them together to get um, we, you, the, the, the property that it has to crack uh, to when you take the tenses of them in a certain way, minus the identity. When you add them all together, you get the identity matrix. And then it's a matter of showing that, that you have that, that you have um, because the symmetric matrix is only six dimensional, then you have enough uh, these sort of matrices that you get have a linearly independent, and then you use the inverse function theorem and look at it, but you get that. But actually, you still need 24. Sure, I mean, it, it comes nowhere else in the argument, but, but this argument, the original argument that they had um, in, in the paper, you could do it with less wave vectors. And it's a simpler proof. But it's not a very important. 